Oh, twelve hundred miles, its length and breadth, that four square city stand. Its gem set walls of jasper shine, not made by human hands. One hundred miles, its gates are wide, abundant entrance there. With fifty miles of elbow room on either side to spare. Oh, the gates swing wide on the other side, just beyond the sunset sea. There'll be room to spare as we enter there. Room for you and room for me. For the gates are wide on the other side, where the pharaoh's flowers bloom. On the right hand and on the left hand, fifty miles of elbow room. Sometimes. I'm cramped and crowded here and long for elbow room. I long to reach for altitude where fairest flowers bloom. It will be mine when I shall step into that city fair with fifty miles of elbow room on either side to spare. All oh, the gates swing wide on the other side, just beyond the sunset sea. There'll be room to spare as we enter there, room for you and room for me. For the gates are wide on the other side, where the pharaoh's flowers bloom. On the right hand and on the left hand, fifty miles of elbow room. Well, sometimes I'm cramped and crowded here and long for elbow room. I long to reach for altitude where fairest flowers bloom. It will be mine when I shall step into that city fair with fifty miles of elbow room on either side to spare. Oh, the gates are wide on the other side, just beyond the sunset sea. There'll be room to spare as we enter there, room for you and room for me. For the gates are wide on the other side, where the pharaoh's flowers bloom on the right hand. And on the left hand, fifty miles of elbow room. I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the winds, they try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock I can feel the waters rise I can hear the howling lies that haunt me Fear won't hold me now My feet are on the rock When I feel my hope about to break I will cling to you Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain My feet are on the rock I can see the morning light I can feel the joy on the horizon Hear 
my faith is found I stand on solid ground When I feel my hope about to break I will cling to your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain My feet are on the rock Christ the solid rock, I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, so praise His name and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock, I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, praise His name and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock, I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, praise His name and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. I will cling to your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain When I feel my hope about to break I'm gonna cling to your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain Was a time that I swore I would never go back I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had I was running, I was searching But every place I turned for healing Left me more broken than the last Take me back to a place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church Tried to walk on my own, but I wound up lost Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross It's not a trophy for the wind it's a shelter for the sinners And it's right where I belong Take me back To the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back To the preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I have first Oh, I want to go
the scribes and the Pharisees were all gathered round him as a boy in the temple speaking with such wisdom they were all amazed at what he said and in the middle of it all there was spoke of one who was to come baptizing with fire when John baptized him the heavens were open and God descended like a dove and in the middle of it all there was In the middle of it all, there was Jesus. So no matter what you're facing, no matter where you've been, in hard times or in good times, I place your eyes on Him, even in the heat of battle. Or
in that homeland of the soul. My spear will never more pine. And I'll be in that number when that sweet melody rolls in heaven. I'll shout and shine. I'm gonna shout. I'm gonna shout. I'm gonna shine. I'm gonna shine in that city of love divine. Over there. Over there. No more cares. With the saints all shout and shine Shout and shine Shout and shine Shout and shine I'm gonna shout I'm gonna shout I'm gonna shine in that city of love divine Over there Free from care With the saints all shout and shine Hard to beat that singing right there, isn't it? I don't know, I looked upon the crowd, looked like this section right in here, looked like their boilers right ready to explode, ain't that right, Casey? Huh? They're fired up this morning. Let's just uh, get behind your pastor as he comes, gives you the word this morning. If I can this morning, you know. Uh, it's good to see everyone out this morning. I really appreciate the presence of the Lord here this morning, too. Thank God. I know that uh, you're a spoiled bunch of people because it ain't everywhere you go where you got the kind of singing you have and you sit there real calm and enjoy it. I guess it's entertaining to us, but. Uh, I, I don't ever want to fail to thank the Lord because everybody don't have that everywhere you go. They sure don't, so you're spoiled. Appreciate the singing this morning. I, uh, I got a message this morning that, uh, I don't know, I arrived at it a lot different way than I usually do. And uh, the uh, scripture is in Isaiah, 43rd chapter. If you want to turn there, it's Isaiah chapter 43, and I'll just read a couple of verses there this morning. We do appreciate, uh, I know we've got some that are uh, visiting, and then we've got some that are here whenever you're not out preaching or singing somewhere else. Uh, uh, Casey and his gang come here a lot when they're not out, and we appreciate them being here this morning. And uh, just wanna, want us to settle in on a thought this morning. There is hope this morning in the promises of God. Let me read you these two verses. It says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Yeah. And when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Now, in my Thompson chain reference Bible that I have, King James Version, um, page 779, at the top of the page, it says God's promise to the church. Yeah. Then when you turn to this chapter 43, at the top of it, it said the Lord comforts the church with his promises. That's what it says at the top of the heading in my Bible. Now... I know that uh, 
You start reading this, it says, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. And you might be thinking, now wait a minute, if this is to the church, why does it say to Jacob and to Israel? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I want to go over here to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading in verse 12, and read you a few verses here. It said, that at that time ye were without Christ. He's talking about us, Gentiles here. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. See, we didn't have part in this thing in the beginning. Having no hope and without God in the world. A lot of people in that shape this morning. If you don't have God this morning, you don't have no hope in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. <laughs> For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us. And you get what it's saying here. He's talking about the wall partition between the Jews and the Gentiles. Having abolished in his flesh, that's Christ when he died on the cross, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of two or of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off and them which were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. Isn't that good right there? I could just quit right now and we could just shout about that for a little while, that we now are part of the commonwealth of Israel. We're part of the promises and the covenant God made with his people. We have been brought into that covenant this morning. And when I read you this scripture, it was to the church. It was to Israel, but it was us too that he was talking about where he said, fear not for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. You know, there's a lot of places I go that I don't feel a part of. I feel out of place. I don't like to go to them kind of places. Sometimes you don't have a choice, you have to. But you go places and you don't really feel welcome, you feel out of place when you get there. I am glad that I'm in a place this morning, as Jevick said, well, I wanna go to church. There's people here that know me, You've known me through my best times and you've seen me through my worst times. You know, but you still, still love me, you still uphold me. That's the thing about the church of God and being part of this commonwealth, no matter what we may have went through or how badly we may have failed, we're still part of the family of God and he knows me by my name this morning. I'm glad that he calls me by my name, thank God. Thou art mine. And he said, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Now, he was talking to some people here in this story who knew what, they knew a little bit about going through the waters. <laughs> they knew a little bit about going where the flood was. The children of Israel, you know, if you go back in history and back to the book of Exodus, when Moses was leading the children of Israel out, and you, you know, there's all the stories I could go into it. I'm not going to, because I, I told my wife I was going to make this about a 15 minute message, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. But anyway, back in the Old Testament, when Moses was leading the children of Israel out, you know how God brought all the plagues upon Egypt and finally they were glad to get rid of them. They said, okay, take your people, take your stuff and get out of here. So they, as they left it in, God kept, if you study it, he always hardened the heart of Pharaoh. So he let them go, but not very far after they took off, he took off after them with his army to, to pursue them. But God protected him through this whole thing. He had a, a pillar of fire that he would lead him at nighttime, a cloud by day that he would keep them hid from the army of Pharaoh so they couldn't get to him. So he put a hedge about it, but they, here they come. They got in up to the Red Sea. And I believe that the passage if you study a little bit, uh, some historians say that where they came through, they came through some mountains down into that area. So here was rocky cliffs behind them, the Red Sea in front of them, and Pharaoh's army was hot on their trail. They couldn't retreat. 
They couldn't go back to where they came from and the Red Sea was in front of them. Seemed like there was no hope for them at that time. They were trapped, Jeff. But what did they do? They, well, the children of Israel started doing just like we do. They started murmuring and complaining again to Moses. You know, it wasn't good enough for us to, you know, you should have left us in Egypt. It wasn't good enough to die in the wilderness. Now you brought us out of here. Here we are. What are we going to do? A lot of us are like that, aren't we? You holy people probably aren't, but I'm like that, okay? <laughs> uh, I'll get in a bad spot, Doug, and I begin to say, oh my goodness, how did I get here? Lord, why, why me or why have you allowed this to happen to me? But you know what always comes to me? Why not me? You know, there's been a whole lot better people than me that suffered a lot of things in this life before they got out of this world. But we got a promise of a heaven on the other side. We got a promise that there's a better place for us to go. And this short life that we live here, I don't care if you suffer the whole time you're here. It's short compared to eternity. I'd rather suffer a little bit here and be able to live with him in eternity, wouldn't you? But here they were at the Red Sea and they began whining, but Moses, he said, stand still. He said, first thing he said was, fear ye not. That was a phrase that many times I come over when I was studying this message, fear ye not. And he said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And Moses raised his rod up over the sea and it said the waters parted. Now, you can come up with whatever theory you got for that. You know, everybody tries to explain away the miracles in the Bible. I believe it just like it said. I think he stretched forth his rod and I think the wall stood up on both sides of water. There was a wall of water on each side of it. And it said the Lord sent an east wind that blew all night long and dried up the bottom of that sea and they walked across on the other side on dry ground. Like I said, you can try to explain that away, but I believe that's just the way it happened, Casey. And they walked across on the dry ground, the children of Israel. And then he removed that cloud that had them separated from Pharaoh's army. And man, here they come in pursuit of the children of Israel again. So they thought, well, they crossed this Red Sea, we're gonna cross it too. And they took off in their chariots and their horses and they were running into that water at full speed, I believe. They got out in the middle of it and what did God do? He brought the waters together. Those walls of water standing on either side crushed that army and drowned them. And they said they, their bodies floated up to the shore on the sides of the seashore. And I believe that's just the way it happened. But here's the whole story. What happened, you know, they were scared to death. They were afraid they'd gonna drown. You know, the only thing that drowned was the thing that was chasing them, the thing that was after them, the thing that they feared was the only thing that drowned in that Red Sea. He said, also, if you read on, I got way ahead of myself here. But anyway, they crossed over, here they were. Then he said on the next verse, when thou passest through the fire, you know, he said, when thou pass through the water, I'll be with thee. When thou, when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Now, I know you all know the story of the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how that the king had made a golden image and told him everybody's gonna bow down. Now, he had some guys puffing him up in his kingdom. They didn't like the fact that the king had brought these Hebrew boys Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in and put them in charge of the provinces where they were at. When God begins to, you know, he was on their side. He knew these boys, he called them by name. God knew who they were, he knew they were in captivity, but yet he was blessing them every day of their life, even there in captivity. He put them in charge of the provinces they were in. Well, the local boys didn't like that. Hey, he brought these guys in, these Hebrew boys, and he put them in charge over our people. You know, it should have been us in charge. What'd they do? They went and said, King, I think you ought to make a big image of yourself. Well, that puffed him up pretty good right there. So he made a big image and put it up in front of everybody. He said, we're gonna play music, and when we do, everybody's gonna bow down and worship you. Well, the king liked the sound of that idea pretty good, you know. They was, they was a... They was puffing him up. Be careful when somebody does that too much. <laughs> but anyway, he said, okay, when we play the music, you all bow. So they played their music and everybody bowed, but 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they didn't bow. So this guy that came up with this idea, he, went, he was a tattletale too. He went to the king and said, hey, them Hebrew boys that you put over there, over them provinces, they're not bowing whenever we play the music. What well, made the king mad? So he called them in. He said, okay, boys, maybe you didn't understand the direction, so I'm gonna give you another chance. He said, whenever you hear the music and all that, I want you to, to bow, and if you do, you'll be okay, but if you don't, we're gonna cast you into a fiery furnace. Yeah. Now, I know these boys stood for God. They wouldn't bow. They didn't take a knee. No. They stood. I'm gonna tell you, we need to stand for God today. There's a lot of things going on in this world and it may come down to it that we may be in the same shape they was in where our life may be at stake if we stand for God. But I'm gonna tell you this, he'll see us through, I believe that. Here's how these boys' attitude was. He said, we're not careful to answer you in this matter of king. He said, if, if it be so that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, let it be known to thee, O king, <laughs> I like this, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship thy golden image which thou hast set up. Now this really made King Nebuchadnezzar mad when they told him that. <laughs> you know, he said, our God's able to deliver us, but if he don't, we're still not bowing to your gods. <laughs> we're still not gonna bow to your image. They were willing to die for what they believed in. So the king, it made him really mad. He said, okay, heat her up seven times hotter than it ever been heated before. Now this was a brick furnace. This was a brick oven that they made, that they had been making the, the children of Israel had made bricks in them for them, by the way. They knew what it was all about. But he said, heat her up seven times hotter. And they sent some of their strongest soldiers to lead them up to the top of that thing and they was gonna drop them down in. It, it, in my mind, it looked like a volcano, sort of with an opening at the bottom that they would shove the bricks in and fire the brick. And it, had, it was like a big chimney. So they took them up to the top of it. And when they went to shove them down in or throw them into the thing, they were bound up with ropes, had them all tied up, took them up and cast them in. It was so hot that it killed the men that took them up there. And the king, when this all took place, he jumped up out of his chair and said, hey, didn't we put three men bound into this furnace? They said, yeah, king, that's, that's what we done. He said, I see four men loose in the fire and the fourth is like unto the son of God. Now, I don't know how he knew that. I, there, nobody can tell me how he knew that, but he recognized who was in the fire with the Hebrew boys, the one that calls me by name. Jesus, I believe, was right in the fire with them there, Casey. He followed him right into the fire. And you know the only thing that was burned on them is that when they came out, there wasn't a hair singed on their head. Their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. The only thing that burned off of them, the king said, come on out, boys. <laughs> you know, come on out. He changed his attitude then. He was calling your God that has delivered you. He, he changed things a little bit after that. He said, come on out of there, and they did. And the only thing that was burned off of them was the things that had them bound. The ropes that bound them when they went in was the only thing that come off of them in the fire. I'm gonna tell you. So, thank God, hey, amen, it's a word, thank God. What's keeping you bound this morning? What's holding you back? Now I would be I'd be a Christian this morning, but, you know, that's always it. Everybody has good intentions. I don't know anybody who set out in life that said, I want to go to hell. I don't know if anybody has that thought in life, Bob. None of us. We all think somewhere down the road, I'm going to give my heart to the Lord. I want to go to that place called heaven. I want to make it there, the place that they're all talking about. And I'm going to tell you what, it's a whole lot better way to live right here on this earth too. I know we got heaven, the promise of heaven to look forward to. But I love walking with him every day, Jeff. The man that knows my name and calls me by my name. I know who he is and he knows me. Thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
<laughs> Amen. Thank God. You don't know what I've done. You don't know. You know, I read you in chapter 12, or chapter 2 and verse 12 of Hebrews earlier. In that same chapter, Paul said, And you hath he quickened. And that means brought to life. Who were dead in trespasses and sin. And verse 6 says, By grace you are saved. And verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, but it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Here's what I'm telling you. You can't do enough good things to make it into heaven. By grace are you saved through faith. And if you try to figure it all out, you try to put it all together, how it works, and how can a, a man die on a cross and shed his blood for my sin. And me just believe in that and I'm changed and I'm gonna be fit for the kingdom of heaven. I don't know how to explain that. I was raised on a farm and I don't know how a black cow can eat green grass and give white milk. I don't know how all that works, but it does. And it's the same way with salvation. You, I just know this, when I open up the jug and get me a drink of that milk, I enjoy it, Steve. And it's the same way with my salvation. I don't know how it works exactly, but I know this, when he saved me and he changed me and made, cleaned me up, took an old boy whose heart was black with sin and he applied that red blood to me and I became white. I became fit for the kingdom of God, not because of any work that I'd done, but because of the work that he done on the cross. Thank God, it's by grace, through faith are you saved. And it's a gift this morning. Thank God. You say, I'm afraid he won't accept me. I'm gonna tell you just exactly how you'll find God this morning. Jeremiah 29, 13, you shall seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. When you get to the place that you're tired of the life you're living. And I'm gonna tell you, there's 50, over 53 million people in America right now in that very shape that don't know Christ as their savior. I got these facts from somebody else from another ministry, the Billy Graham ministry. He, he's got some pretty smart people out there checking this stuff out. But he says that there's people that's seeking for hope this morning and they don't have it, Freddie. But you know, he said in Jeremiah that when you seek me with your whole heart, you'll be found of me. You know why they're not finding him? You know why a lot of churches don't experience the presence of God like we felt here this morning? Because they're not seeking him with their whole heart. You go about this thing half-heartedly and that's what you'll get. But if you want to be found of him, seek him with your whole heart this morning. He said he was in no wise cast you out. More than 65 million Americans, ages 12 and older, abuse or are addicted to drugs and or alcohol. You know, they feel worthless this morning, but Isaiah, the text that I read, 43, one said, I have called thee by name, thou art mine. He said in verse four, you are precious in my sight. I have loved you. You may not feel like you're worth anything this morning, but there's a God in heaven this morning who loves you, who cares for you. He knows exactly where he's got the hair on your head numbered. That's how much he cares for you this morning. And he's looking down on you this morning and he wants to bring you that hope. He wants to bring you that peace that I'm trying to tell you about this morning. And you can have him if you'll seek him this morning with your whole heart. Over 47,000 people in America commit suicide each year because they feel like they have no hope. You know, we're worried about COVID-19 and all these things, and it is bad. But you think of that, 47,000 people that don't have to be. That does not have to be that they commit suicide. But they get in the shape where they feel like they have nowhere to go. They feel like they have no hope. And that's where the enemy wants to get you this morning. If he can get you to that place so you're willing to take your own life. That is exactly what he would do this morning. He's out to seek and destroy every one of us this morning if he can do that. But we have a hope this morning. <laughs> Listen to this. That's steadfast. I'm glad for that this morning. You say, I'm afraid. He said, oh God of our salvation, Psalm 65, 5, the hope of all the ends of the earth. You're not hopeless. We got hope in him. He's the hope of all ends of the earth. You say, I'm afraid. He said, fear not, 
for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and I will strengthen ye. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I want you to understand something. It's not your righteousness. It's not my righteousness, but it's his righteousness this morning that's upholding me with his right hand. What is that? That's showing strength, his right hand. I'm right-handed. I can't do anything left-handed, hardly. But that's the strong arm is my right arm, or at least it used to be. And he said he's going to uphold me with his right hand. His strength is my strength this morning. You may feel like you're passing through the waters. You may feel like you're about to drown. And the only thing that drowned that I just read you were the things that were not of God. Pharaoh's army, the things that were not of God. You may feel like you're in the fire and the only thing that burned off of these boys were the ropes that held them. The thing that was holding them back was the only thing that burned. You're in a world where most everything in this world today is unsure. I know that you wonder if you'll have a job. Some of you are laid off because of this. And you're wondering if you'll have a job to go back to. And several small businesses, they already look for them to never open their doors again. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We have no surety, but I'm glad I know who holds tomorrow. He is sure and he will uphold me with his strong right hand. I was talking about these people committing suicide and in depression and we are facing right now a lot of people who are in depression. And this thing may be much worse than COVID-19 because eventually they're gonna find, I believe, a vaccine probably for this and it'll probably get better. But people who get in this depression, it's not an easy thing to get out of. Not as easy as you may think. My brother David suffered from depression. Always felt like he didn't measure up. I don't know. I know there's different things. He was a second child. And sometimes they already come out feeling inferior because they're the second child. They weren't the first. And uh, my brother Phil, he was a smart one in the bunch. That's what I always said. He got out of logging. He got out of farming. He went to college. He was a valedictorian of his high school class. And he was valedictorian of his college class. And, and then he went on to high State and he graduated top out of 200 dental students in his class. He graduated the top in medicine out of that class. Now I'm gonna tell you, to be top in your class out of 30 kids at Blue Creek School or 25 kids, that probably wasn't too big a feat. <laughs> I'm not saying anything bad about Blue Creek. Some of the best people I know come from Blue Creek. That was my favorite school I ever attended and the best years of my life, I think, was right there at Blue Creek. So I'm not down in Blue Creek, but I'm just saying, you know, 25 kids probably or so in that class, I don't know exactly what his graduating class was. But to get into dental school at Ohio State, when they only accept 200 students into that program, not real easy to do to start with. Then to graduate, you know, he graduated from Asbury College, and Asbury's not a real big school either. It's a Methodist school down in Kentucky. Wilmore, Kentucky, and he graduated top in his class there. That was, that was pretty good. And there were some brilliant people, by the way, in his class down there. But to, to do that at Ohio State out of a group of 200 dental students, I'd say he's a pretty smart guy, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, he was a hard worker, I'll put it that way. He studied more than anybody I know. I didn't have that. I hate to study, I hate to read. But anyway, Phil went on, done great. Now, Dave was the best athlete in our family, but he never seen himself that way. He played ball at Blue Creek when Jeff May played. Most of you here, if you know any history of basketball in this area, you know who Jeff May was. At that, up to that time, and maybe since then, probably the best basketball player, really, to come out of this area. He scored 50-some points in a game back when they was all two-pointers. There wasn't no three-pointers. And... Uh, you know, he could do it. He was like a machine. I watched him. He lived next door to the school. He played ball every day. And he'd go over and shoot. So Dave always felt like he was inferior. You know, now, when we played Peebles, you know what they'd done? They loaded up on Jeff. They double teamed him. And my brother Dave scored 32 points that night, and they still beat Peebles. Sorry about that, Ted. <laughs> they still beat Peebles that night. 
And everybody said, watch May, watch May. And we was out. My mom didn't have a washer and dryer back in them days. We went to the laundromat. And we were at the laundromat and people, not just a little boy. And mom heard them over there talking. You know, we could hear them. Some, the guy that owned the laundromat, and they were big for, sports fans back then. You, you know Franklin. Uh, yeah. And uh, so they was talking about it. So they said, watch May, watch May, and Brown beat us. You know, they were mad. <laughs> they didn't watch that Brown boy, and he beat us. But he still never felt like he measured up, no matter what good things he'd done in life or how great he may have done. And then after he got married and had a little girl, Lisa, and Lisa got sick with spinal meningitis at 14 months, and they... They put her in the hospital or wasn't nothing. She got, uh, her heart stopped and really that's basically what done her in as far as her brain damage. There was no oxygen to her brain for quite a while. The doctor worked and worked with her and they saved her life, but really she's never had a life since. And she's still alive today down in Cincinnati in a little home down there that she stays in. She got too big for Peggy to carry. She carried her until she had muscles in her arm like a man from packing that little girl. But she finally got too big to carry and she had to do something with her and they put her in that home. And David felt guilty. He was the only one that regularly went down there and never failed to go see that little girl. He loved her. And he felt like, and I'm gonna tell you this, there was a person in church back at that time told him that he believed that it was his fault because he wasn't saved that that's why that happened to Lisa. So be careful, church people, what you say to people. Be careful what you say because you could ruin somebody's life. You could put, help bury them deeper in depression. He didn't need to hear that at that time. But here he was in deep depression and he was in Cincinnati in a psych ward in a hospital down there. Not where I wanted my brother to be. Went down to visit him, me and my wife, and he couldn't even believe that we come to see him. You know, I don't know what made Dave that way, why he had that depression. You know, Steve came along after Dave, and Steve was, he was kind of dad's right arm. He always was with dad, wherever dad went. And Steve had a knack for running equipment, always good on equipment. And Dave didn't measure up there. He didn't feel like he was as good on equipment. Then I come along, and I was just cute, you know. <laughs> Wasn't nothing else. <laughs> I was the baby, and I came along... No, I don't, I don't know. I can't tell you what all added to his grief or what made him feel that way in his life. But he felt, he got to the place where he felt he was worthless, Doug. And he was down there in that psych ward. He called my mom. He said, I found what I've been looking for. And he gave her the scripture in Psalms chapter 30 and verse 5. said, weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And he said, I'm holding on to that. He told mom he had prayed and he felt like he had found the Lord. This was about two o'clock in the morning when he called her. But I'm so glad that he, no matter how low you may get in this life, you're never too low that you can't reach up to him and he'll be reaching down, I guarantee you that. He'll reach that hand down to you and pull you up to where he is, thank God. Thankful for that tonight or today. So you may feel like you don't have no hope. Hebrews 6, the writer says this, lay hold on the hope set before us. In verse 19, he said, which hope we have <clears throat> as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. In a world where pretty much everything right now that we've known in our lifetime is pretty unsure right now. We're wondering about going back to school, some of you have, some of us are getting ready to next week. And there's been many made this statement that they look for us to be there two or three weeks and then shut it all down again. I hope not. And you're wondering, will I have a job to go back to? Will I lose my retirement? You know, you may think your 401k is secure and I don't care where you got it. There's nothing secure right now financially in this world that we can count on. All these things are legit, legitimate concerns. I, I understand all that, but I got, I'm telling you this, I am anchored in Jesus this morning. The songwriter said, I'm anchored in Jesus. The storms of life I'll brave. I've anchored in Jesus. I fear no wind or wave. I've anchored in Jesus, for he hath power to save. I am anchored in the rock of ages this morning. I'm glad I know who my anchor's in. 
Now, I know who I'd like to see win this coming election. But I'm going to tell you this. My hope's not in Joe Biden nor Donald Trump. My hope is in, anchored in the Rock of Ages this morning. And you can have that same hope. You can have that same anchor this morning. As we stand to our feet, I'm finished. I hope that something I've said this morning has struck home with you. I don't know if you are in depression this morning. And it's like we have made that. You know, if you got cancer, there is nobody down on you for having cancer. It's not your fault that you got that disease. Most likely, it's in your genes. <laughs> it was passed on to you. All of us are born with cancer cells. Some of them mutate. Some of them different things happen. But here's the deal. We don't look down on people for that. But if somebody's in depression, it's like a, they feel like they're cursed by society or something. I don't know what it is. They're not, they don't feel free to bring that out or to tell people or to confide in people. But I'm here to tell you this. It's just as real as cancer this morning. And if the enemy can get you beat down, that's what he wants to do to every one of us. And if he can destroy your faith, if your faith and your hope is in this life only, Paul said we'd be of all men most miserable if our hope's in this life only. But we have such a greater hope this morning, those of us that know Jesus Christ. We have got a great hope this morning. We've got something that'll pull us onward and pull us upward when this life is over. I'm gonna leave this place behind. All the old junk that I got that breaks down every week, I'm gonna leave it all behind, Tyson. I won't have to worry no more about any of that. But I'm gonna be looking to a brand new home, one that I didn't build, one that I had nothing to do with, but all I had to do was accept him this morning. Would you come while we bow our heads this morning just for a few moments? Is there one here would like to step out and say, I want the church to pray?